but I, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about my, uh, my book, Lincoln Unmasked. My publisher chose the title. Uh, I wanted to something like That Stinkin' Lincoln, but it was, uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, but the, they chose uh, Lincoln Unmasked, uh, What You're Not Supposed to Know About Dishonest Abe. And af after my first book uh, came out and, uh, and created sort of a national uh, debate over, uh, over the legacy of, of, uh, of Lincoln and, and the Civil War and, and many other things, I, I kept, kept at it, kept, I, had, I found that I had uh, researchers all over the world sending me all sorts of really good stuff. I, mean, I have a, a PhD student uh, uh, for, uh, for years who's been in the, ar the National Archives digging around like a gopher, just find, sending me great research material uh, for free. I, I, I haven't even bought him a cup of coffee or anything like that. And so, <laughs> and so, and so between my own efforts and then all this um, information that people have been sending me, I decided to keep on researching and writing on, on the same topic. And so I, and I had enough to put together a new book, uh, which I did, it was published in October. And I broke it down into uh, three sections. And the, the first is uh, what you're not supposed to know about Lincoln and his war is uh, section one. And uh, the section two is economic issues you're supposed to ignore. And section three is the politics of the Lincoln cult. And, uh, and so uh, one of the things I learned from this whole uh, um, uh, episode uh, of the publication of The Real Lincoln, my, my first book, was that there really is a Lincoln cult, really a sort of a cult-like behavior on the part of a lot of academics who write, who write about uh, Lincoln. And it's sort of a religious thing to some people. Um, uh, Harry Jaffa and his, and his friends at the Claremont Institute uh, persistently refer to him as Father Abraham, for example. And, uh, I've run across the literature that uh, always seems to remind us that he did die on Good Friday, and uh, and he he died he died for America's sins just like Christ died for the sins of the world. They say these things, and, and there's a book published a couple of years ago called Redeemer President. Uh, the implication is if you want redemption for your sins, well you know who to embrace as your savior, and so uh, and it just it's a cult, and so. Um, so I have several chapters on uh, the politics of the Lincoln cult. And so what I thought I'd do today is, uh, and, and I, I had, when I was writing this, I had an eye toward not repeating anything that was in the real Lincoln. Now there's one sh short chapter at the beginning that's a brief summary of some of the main points of that book for readers who had not read that book and picked this one up. And uh, would sort of peak, I was hoping to pique their interest so they go buy that book too. Um, my publisher was interested in making money, unlike Randy Holcomb's uh, uh, publisher. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the Random House has been at it for a longer time, I guess, in the route, route ledge. Um, and so that, that's, that's what I did. I had an eye toward not repeating things that were in, in the real Lincoln, except very, very, very briefly. And so I'll give you an idea of some of the things that I did in this book, and, and of course, uh, the argument I made in the first book was that uh, I consider Lincoln to be the founding father of big government in America, and, and then the Civil War was a breaking point. And uh, some of my old friends in the room are, are, are familiar with the fact that uh, some years ago, I think it was probably at least seven or eight years ago, I was giving a short talk at a conference in D.C., and the topic was the growth of government, and I was asked to comment on a, a paper by Richard Vedder, where Vedder said that uh, government growth didn't really crowd out the private economy much until the 1960s. And I was the discussant. I was given 10 minutes to be the discussant. And I made the case that he was about a, off by about 100 years, because I thought that I made the case that the Civil War was an important breaking point with uh, uh, the National Currency Acts, uh, the first income tax ever, uh, tariff rates went up to about 50% and stayed there for 60 years. And Jack Kemp happened to be in the audience, the politician Jack Kemp. And every time I would say something, I would say like uh, the first federal conscription law was passed, and he would boo and hiss very loudly. <laughs> and it got to the point that I, I couldn't concentrate on what I was saying, so I had to stop and ask if someone else was scheduled to speak at the same time. <laughs> and, uh, and, Kemp, uh, and Kemp went storming out of the room. He, he, left, he got up, he pulled his chair back, and, and, uh, and, and this, this went all around the world in about a minute. I had emails from people I hadn't heard from in 20 years. They heard about the story of my uh, chasing Jack Kemp out of an auditorium. <laughs> and I didn't even mention the word Lincoln. This was before I wrote anything about Abe Lincoln. It was, all I mentioned was you know, the National Currency Act was a bad idea. I just, and he was booing and hissing when I would say that. Because in the, 
in the fu uh, even funnier, my wife was waiting, was outside uh, this uh, banquet room at a Sheraton Hotel in D.C., and she said afterwards, she said, boy, I'm sitting there, and I see Jack Kemp come storming out the door and swearing and cussing, and, and she's thinking, boy, somebody in there really made him angry. And, and, and what is, what was it? Is it? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but that's, you know, so this is sort of a, uh, been a quite of a, a weird experience. There really is a religious thing for people like Jack Kemp, uh, I guess, and quite a few others. And so uh, some of the things I, I ran across is uh, uh, there's a whole slew of fake quotes. I, I found that most Americans know little or nothing about it, about the topic, other than a few slogans they learned in junior high school, and that much of what they learn is, is not true anyway. And, 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 uh, and so I have a whole chapter called Fake Lincoln Quotes. It's based mostly on, uh, there's a book published by Oxford University Press. There was a team of researchers that looked through some of the more famous quotes uh, and, uh, and tried to and ask the question, is there any documentation for this? And, there, and there's a whole bunch of them that there's no documentation that they ever said these things. And the book is called They Never Said It, a book of fake quotes, misquotes, and misleading attributions. And it's not all about Lincoln. It's about a number of uh, areas. But, uh, and so, uh, to give you an idea, and, uh, and I've had fun with this, because in my debates with the uh, so-called Lincoln scholars, they often pull these quotes out, and, and you know, as part of their argument, and then I have this reference guide of mine, and I can say, well, it's a fake quote, it's, it's never, and here's one of them, uh, uh, there was the American Enterprise Magazine devoted a whole issue uh, a couple of years ago, after my book came out, pretty much to uh, criticizing me. Uh, was the motivation by it, the whole Civil War issue, and they, and they criticized Lou Rockwell too in there. Although they didn't quote him, uh, they didn't quote him as saying anything. They, since he published some of my work on his website, they, they stuck him in there, but he, he, they didn't say anything that he said on the topic. Um, but uh, one of the uh, authors, Jay Winnick, was wrote one of the articles, and it was it was great fun because he he quoted Lincoln as saying this about slavery: "If I ever get a chance to hit that thing, I'll hit it hard." And uh, it's a fake. He never said that. So I was able to point out that there was a fake quote, he never said that. Um, he supposedly said this, I've never known a worthwhile man to, uh, who became too big for his boots or his Bible. Uh, another fake quote, according to these people. And Lincoln, of course, well, was not a believer and never joined a church, but he was good at quoting the Bible, but he didn't, he didn't say that. Um, he supposedly became a Christian at Gettysburg after seeing all the mass graves. And, the, and there are quite a few preachers in America who tell this story. He supposedly said this, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. Yes, I do love Jesus. Fake, never said that. And so, and this is good for generations. People have been taught, uh, somebody sent me uh, uh, an email saying that uh, uh, James Dobson, the Reverend James Dobson, uh, tells this story all the time and uses this fake quote. He never said that. He supposedly said, God must have loved the common people. He made so many of them. Didn't say it. Uh, he supposedly said, if this nation is to be destroyed, it will be destroyed from within. Uh, didn't say that either. Uh, he, he supposedly said, the restoration of the rebel states to the Union must rest upon the principle of civil and political equality of both races. That's a real howler. He never said that. In fact, you can easily find him saying exactly the opposite in many, many instances. He never even said, you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. He never said that. I think everybody in this room who grew up in the U.S. was probably taught that in elementary school, but he never even said that. And so, uh, so that's, that's one thing that's different from my earlier, earlier book that, uh, is, that it wasn't there. Another thing I did was uh, I, I have a chapter about, entitled uh, An Abolitionist Who Despised Lincoln about Lysander Spooner. So I thought uh, it would be appealing to a lot of libertarians. Spooner was, uh, was filled with hate for the Lincoln regime. And he, the, his, all of his collected papers are on the Internet. And you can read uh, his letters uh, to Senator Charles Sumner and uh, Secretary of State William Seward. And uh, that if you print them out and, and pull them out, be careful you don't burn your fingers because it's really, really incendiary uh, 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 writing uh, on Spooner's part. And, uh, and what was he saying? Here's what he said to, uh, uh, I'll pick one for uh, what he said to Sumner. He said, uh, had, had all those men at the North who believed these ideas about, that is, about the, the unconstitutionality of slavery to be true, had promulgated them as was their plain and obvious duty to do, 
it is reasonable to suppose that we should long since have had freedom without shedding one drop of blood. The South could consistently with honor and probably would long before this time and without a conflict have surrendered their slavery to the demand of the Constitution and to the moral sentiment of the world. You and others like you have done more according to your abilities to prevent the peaceful abolition of slavery than any other men in the nation. And so he was, uh, Spooner wrote a book called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery in the 1840s, and he was always pushing for the peaceful abolition of, of slavery like all other nations on the earth that ended slavery in the 19th century did. And, uh, and he, he thought that the war was uh, unnecessary in terms of getting rid of slavery because no one, the British, the, the Spanish, the, the Dutch, the French, they didn't have a war involved in, in, the, in the way they ended slavery. And he said this, Spooner said, in your pretended zeal for liberty, you have been urging the nation to the most frightful destruction of human life and through a series of years betrayed the very citadel of liberty which you were under oath to defend. There has been no other treason at all comparable with this. So he's, he's accusing Lincoln, Seward, Sumner, and the rest of the treason there. So that's what I meant when I said this is really um, hot stuff, incendiary, incendiary uh, writing. And so that's, that's something else that's, that's new. Uh, another thing I did was, uh, was uh, I, I had a chapter on the Northern states' rights tradition. And I think most Americans who know anything about this topic uh, don't seem to understand that you know, the whole business about states' rights or dual sovereignty, as James Madison called it, that was a Northern tradition as well as a Southern tradition. Uh, when, when Andrew Jackson had his big confrontation with the Bank of the United States, he had a lot of help from politicians at the state level, like the state of Ohio. Uh, when the, the Bank of the United States opened up a branch in Ohio, they taxed it like Maryland did. They, they put, put a, a $50,000 per branch tax. Uh, this is in the 1830s, uh, around eight, early 1830s, to try to tax it out of existence. And uh, uh, the bank refused to pay. And so the state government of Ohio sent armed, armed police into the bank for the money. They went there with, uh, with a big chest, a big, big chest to fill it up with the money, and they literally jumped over the counter, went into the vault, and took $100,000 out of the Bank of the United States as a tax. They didn't, they didn't want this bank to exist, uh, neither did quite a few other northern states. And so this was a way in which you know, states' rights uh, uh, you know, was able to uh, fend off uh, federal tyranny. That's just one, one simple example. And so I write about these things in this book because most Americans, uh, I think, don't understand that uh, this was a northern as well as a southern tradition, uh, and it was always aimed at a, providing a vehicle for the people to protect themselves against federal tyranny. Uh, it's, not, it's, this, it's not about this nonsense that states don't have rights and only individuals have rights. No, no one ever made that argument. The argument is that the way in which individuals can conceivably defend themselves against this central government is to form political communities at the state and local level and defend themselves against the federal government. It's, the, it's never a matter of something called a state having rights. That's just, that's just the language that, that was used for it. So I, I get into that. Um, other things, um, one thing I didn't mention at all in the real Lincoln because I, I thought it would be, uh, I, I didn't think I could back it up with enough references was uh, the idea that after, after Lincoln suspended habeas corpus and began mass arresting northern civilians who opposed the war, that uh, Judge Taney, Chief Justice, issued a, uh, an arrest war, or uh, issued an opinion that this was unconstitutional for the president alone to uh, suspend habeas corpus. Judge Roger V. Taney uh, uh, was the Supreme, Chief Justice Supreme of the Supreme Court. He was, I think he was the longest sitting Chief Justice. And Lincoln responded, not with a legal argument, but by issuing an arrest warrant. And when I wrote The Real Lincoln, I had one reference on this, and I didn't think that was enough. But since then, I've got several, uh, Charles Adams dug up several, and I dug up uh, one or two more also. And so now we have uh, Benjamin Robbins Curtis, who, was, who wrote the dissenting opinion in the Dred Scott case and who defended Andrew Johnson in his impeachment trial call us in his uh, autobiography saying that the arrest warrant that Lincoln issued for Taney was a great crime, called it a great crime. The mayor of Baltimore at the time, uh, Mayor Brown, in his uh, memoirs, uh, referred to the arrest warrant. He was a friend of Tawney's, and he, so he knew about the arrest warrant. There's a history of the Federal Marshal Service uh, that, uh, published by the federal government that mentions the arrest warrant. So this happened, and so this was a big blow to separation of powers. If you can intimidate 
the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court by threatening to throw him in prison uh, for merely issuing a legal opinion as a circuit court judge, no less, uh, rather than going to court. And I also dug up one of my, this PhD student I mentioned who digs up great stuff for me, went down to the National Archives and found a group of letters from federal judges uh, explaining why they didn't show up on court that day uh, to issue a writ of habeas corpus to someone who had been uh, imprisoned by the Lincoln regime. And, uh, and pretty much, uh, here's what one of them says. This is a federal judge in Washington, D.C. After dinner, I visited my brother judges in Georgetown and returning home between half past seven and eight o'clock, found an armed sentinel stationed at my door by order of the provost marshal. I learned that this guard had been placed at my door as early as five o'clock Armed sentries from that time continuously until now have been stationed in front of my house. And so the federal soldiers were sent to the homes of judges so that they couldn't go to court to issue writs of habeas corpus and have due process occur in the, in, in the northern states. And so it wasn't only Tawny, it was federal judges all, or, all around who were treated like this. Uh, and I, I write about that also. The way the Lincoln cult, as I call it, responded to this originally is to say the one reference um, that was the first reference was by Ward Lehman, who was one of Lincoln's law partners. And, uh, and they said, well, Lehman was a drunk. Can't believe what he says. He's a drunk. And uh, of course, Ulysses S. Grant was a famous drunk, too, but uh, they never questioned what, what, what he says. But, but I have all these other references. So the, in the part on economics, uh, what you know, economic issues you're supposed to ignore uh, one thing that's different is I, I go into a, little, a lot more detail about Lincoln's uh, relationship to the railroad industry. He was, he was a wealthy railroad lawyer. He represented the Illinois Central. He once got $5,000 for a single case. Uh, and back, back in the 1850s, that was a good piece of change for a single case. The governor of Illinois at the time was paid about $3,000 a year, and he got $5,000 in one case. And uh, this particular case, I, I tell the story that... Uh, is out there in a book called Lincoln and the Railroads, of where the, uh, he presented his bill, $5,000 bill, to the Illinois Central. And the vice president of the Illinois Central at the time was uh, a man named George B. McClellan. And it's the same George B. McClellan who would be the, uh, the, uh, the commanding general of the Army of the Potomac a few years later, Lincoln's top general. And he was the vice president of the Illinois Central. <coughs> And McClellan told him, uh, my board of directors in New York City will never pay a, a lawyer from Illinois $5,000. So Lincoln sued. He sued for his fee. And when he went to court, uh, unbelievably, unbelievably, he got a bunch of uh, lawyers from Illinois to testify that $5,000 seemed perfectly acceptable to them as a fee. Could you imagine that? <laughs> so, so, so they all go into court saying, yeah, that sounds okay. That's not too high. And, uh, but the Illinois Central lawyers did not show up. And so by default, he got his $5,000. And so John W. Starr, the author of this book, Lincoln and the Railroads, very strongly hints that this was some sort of uh, corrupt deal between McClellan and Lincoln to get him his $5,000 uh, fee. And so I write about some personal corruption. I have a chapter called The Great Protectionist. Uh, that, was, that chapter was called The Great Railroad Lobbyist. And, uh, and another thing he did was he invested in real estate in Council Bluffs, Iowa in 1857. And uh, because his friend Grenville Dodge, who ended up being the chief engineer for the Transcontinental Railroads, told him that would be a good place for the eastern terminus of the uh, Transcontinental Railroads. And so when he was president, uh, as soon as the war started, he called a special session of Congress to deal with the railroad bill, not the war, but the railroad bill, uh, to start building railroads out to California. And so uh, it took about a year, the railroad bill was passed, and it gave the president of the United States the ability to choose the eastern terminus where they were going to start building the railroad. And anybody would like to venture a wild guess of what, where he chose to start building the Transcontinental Railroad in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Uh, and it's, to this day, that land is called Lincoln's Hill in, in Council Bluffs, uh, Iowa. Uh, so that was the great railroad lobbyist, uh, the great protectionist. Uh, I, I, I put a lot more material in there than I did in the first book. Uh, especially uh, making the case that Lincoln owed everything politically to his uh, history as a protectionist. Uh, how he got the nomination uh, hinged on getting Pennsylvania behind him. And Pennsylvania, the steel industry, they wanted a protectionist. He sent his personal friend, David Davis, who would later be appointed by him as, uh, as a Supreme Court Justice, to Pennsylvania with the original copies of all his pro-protectionism speeches. <laughs> 
uh, to show the uh, Pennsylvania steel industry that this is your man. You know, for 20 some years, he's been making speeches in favor of high tariffs. And the reason this was sort of so secretive is that the farmers of the country were dead set against high tariffs. They, were, they knew that they were always disproportionately harmed, uh, the Midwest farmers and the Southern farmers. And so they didn't want the word to get out to the farmers that he was such a big protectionist. This was before the internet, by the way, so it wasn't, it wasn't easy. And so that's why they were so secretive and he pulled it off. So I make, I make the case that he owed everything politically. And then of course, uh, in his first inaugural address, you know, if you read it uh, the right way, I think you read it, he, he literally threatened an invasion of any state that failed to collect the, the newly increased tariff, tariff rate. And I also have a chapter called The Great Inflationist that uh, explains Lincoln's role in ushering in central banking finally. I sort of try to, try to make it a terse chapter that tells the story of the struggle for central banking, Andrew Jackson's fight with the Bank of the United States, and then where Lincoln and the and his party came in and finally uh, prevailed in getting uh, centralized banking back after Andrew Jackson had uh, defeated the Bank of the United States in the 1830s. In the final chapter, the uh, final section, the politics of Lincoln cult, um, I have one chapter called Making Cannon Fodder. It's, it's, uh, it's sort of a, there's a book called Making Patriots by Walter Burns, and I sort of changed it around a little bit and called it Making Cannon Fodder. <laughs> it's, it's a difficult play on words. And uh, he's an American Enterprise Institute scholar, and he's very troubled in his book that uh, America's youth are not willing enough to join the military to go on global crusades for democracy or something, some nebulous idea, not to defend their country. The, the, the voluntary army works pretty well is that, as far as that goes. But, but he means these, these neocon crusades to save the world and to make the world safe for, uh, for Exxon Mobil and uh, Halliburton and, and whoever. And so that's a real problem. And so the th one of the themes is, well, how can we solve this dilemma of America's youth not wanting to fight the American Enterprise Institute's wars around, <laughs> around the world? Well, we need to, uh, we need to indoctrinate them uh, in the words of a national poet. We need a national poet that will mesmerize them in patriotism and get them to join the army. And uh, fortunately, he says, we have one already. We don't need to invent one. We have one. And Abe Lincoln, who he calls, uh, uh, quote, uh, the martyred Christ of democracy's passion play. And, and so I have a whole chapter about, about, about this book. There's that Jesus Christ analogy again to, uh, with uh, Abe Lincoln. That's a direct quote. That's what he calls him. And he goes on and on in this chapter saying things like, uh, uh, even though he micromanaged the war for four long years and thousands of civilians died as well, not to mention 300,000 fellow citizens who were soldiers, uh, he did this because he loved the people of the South. And he, he says things like this, and, and it's surreal to read these things, but this is what, this is what Lincoln scholarship is like. Uh, I have a chapter called Lincolnite Totalitarians. I write about people such as Eric Foner, if you ever watch anything on television about the Civil War, you're probably going to be lectured to by Eric Foner from Columbia University, who will tell you what to think about the episode on the, the History Channel or whatever it is. <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, I, quote, I cite an article on his, of his from The Nation magazine in 1991, where he opposed the breakup of the Soviet Union, and the title of the article uh, was Lincoln's Lesson. He said, uh, uh, Gorbachev uh, is, uh, doesn't have the, uh, the fortitude that Lincoln uh, did. L Lincoln would never have allowed the Soviet republics to secede peacefully like Gorbachev did. So he was sing saying that Lincoln was much more brutal than the last dictator of the Soviet Union, <laughs> and, uh, and, which, which of course is true, absolutely true. <laughs> and so, uh, and he excoriated him for that. And so, and, and all throughout the, this section, I point to people, any, a lot of conservatives and uh, left-wingers like Foner who uh, make the case for abolishing civil liberties or invading countries that have not harmed us uh, or you know, the breakup of the Soviet Union and invoking the Link Lincoln legend to, uh, to make their case. Uh, Michelle Malkin wrote a book uh, advocating that we round up all the Muslims in America and throw them in concentration camps. It's called In Defense of Internment is the name of the book. And of course, there are Lincoln quotes sprinkled throughout to make the case that if he did it, it must be okay to, to do it. So she makes the case too. And the final, final chapter that I have is called um, Contra the Lincoln Cult. And, uh, and what I found in the, in the several years after the real Lincoln came out is 
if you want to have a career as a historian and you write on this area, there's an official viewpoint and you cannot deviate from that official viewpoint if you want a career as a historian. I'm not a historian, so I don't care. I don't care about the official viewpoint. And so, but, uh, but you have to, you know, you won't have a career. Uh, but if you, if you toe the line, you can have a very good career. There's, there's a, a, there seems to be an unlimited supply of money for awards for the Lincoln Book of the Year. There's $35,000, $50,000 a, a crack for all these, these books that are written. And, but uh, I ran across uh, uh, five or six uh, books by people who are not historians, uh, Lincoln scholars anyway, a couple of them are professional historians, but they don't have, uh, they're not in this game of where my career depends on being a Lincoln scholar and having the, the acceptance of all the other Lincoln scholars of uh, James, Father James McPherson, uh, you know, I need his permission to have my career and, and things like that. And one of the persons was Stephen Weissman, an editorial writer for the New York Times, wrote a book on the history of, inco of the income tax and I, I quote him pretty extensively. He's pretty much agreeing with my whole interpretation of Lincoln and, and the role of economics in Lincoln. Senator James Webb, who's now a senator, he wrote a book on the history of the Scots-Irish in America. And I quote him as, as pretty much agreeing with much of what I said about, uh, about the war. And again, what, what does uh, James Webb care about um, James McPherson's opinion of him? Or, and these other scholars, uh, John, uh, Michael Holt, the, the uh, 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 professor of history at Virginia, he's a scholar, he's a historian, but uh, the antebellum era, era is his area. He's not a Lincoln scholar, but he wrote a little skinny book uh, about three years ago um, on uh, sort of his view of, of the war, and it pretty much is almost identical to my view of what I wrote about. And, and so I, I cite him too. John Steele Gordon, the, the writer on business history, uh, I uh, quote him in support, Michael Lind, the, uh, the liberal uh, writer, Michael Lind, he wrote a book on uh, called What Lincoln Believed. And it's kind of funny because Lind thinks mercantilism is a wonderful thing and we need to bring it back. And so he writes this book uh, about how uh, Lincoln was a, a, a hardcore mercantilist and he, the whole theme of the book is, wasn't that great? That he was <laughs> high tariffs, corporate welfare, uh, central banking, inflationism, all this. That's good stuff, as Michael Lynn says. <laughs> so he, he says he uses the same facts I did, but I, as an economist, I say, well, this, this was bad. This is not a good thing. And for that, I'm excoriated by the history profession. Michael Lynn, I think he won an award, too, for pretty much says the same thing I did. Uh, he's, even, he's even harsher. He, he, he really uh, goes after Lincoln as being a hypocrite with this Bible quoting business of his. And then there's a, a historian named uh, Dahlstrom, whose his last book was a history of the John Deere Tractor Company. So he's not a Lincoln scholar either, but he wrote a book on Lincoln's suppression of the press, of the media. Uh, with uh, a, a co-author named uh, Manber, Jeffrey Manber, and uh, they pretty much uh, tell the same story that I do in, in the real Lincoln on uh, on the suspension of habeas corpus and the shutting down of 300 opposition newspapers in the northern states and so forth, and uh, and uh, so you can't be if you're outside of this Lincoln scholarship circle, you have free speech. You can write these things. If not, you don't. Uh, if you want a career there. And that's, that's the last chapter. And that's, that's what I'll say about this for now. And the sticker price is twenty two ninety five, but it's cheaper on Amazon. So, uh, and, and they are for sale out front, I, I, I believe. Uh, I'll, I'll be glad to autograph any. So, uh, time for questions, Joe, or uh, if anybody has any? Probably not. Okay, they're sick of hearing me talk about this subject anyway. Okay. Uh, do you care to be an armchair psychologist maybe for a minute? Tell us why you think there's this cult of women, why they love them so much, why it's so important to have this perfect hero who never did anything wrong. Well, there are probably a lot of reasons. The case I make in the book is that uh, and it's not original with me. David Donald wrote about this 40 years ago, is that ever, ever since Lincoln uh, became a martyr with his death, uh, politicians of all parties have tried to attach the moral authority of Abraham Lincoln to their cause, whatever their cause was. And Donald mentioned that even the Communist Party USA used to hold Lincoln Lenin Day rallies in New York City. <laughs> and he says, he says in, his, in his book of his, Lincoln Reconsidered, that uh, he once actually went into the headquarters in New York City of the Communist Party, and there were gigantic pictures of Lincoln and Lenin side by side in, the, in there. And so that's why I mentioned like Eric Foner or the right-wingers at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, 
uh, on September 7th, 2006, one of my articles on Lou Rockwell's website was on an article uh, Newt Gingrich had in the Wall Street Journal online making the case for invading uh, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and North Korea. <laughs> and it started with a big Lincoln quote at the top of the article, and then there were more Lincoln quotes in the, in the, middle, in the middle. So I'm not sure it's so psychological than just crass politics of why uh, so many people who have an agenda, whether it's a more socialism or more military adventurism, uh, the whole purpose for existence I've discovered of the Claremont Institute in California is to train congressional uh, staffers and executive branch uh, employees who write speeches for, poli for Republican politicians and enable them to, to know the right Lincoln quotes to stick in there so that Newt Gingrich can write articles like this for the Wall Street Journal and invoke the authority of who they call Father Abraham. Uh, and you know, it's sort of, uh, they, they wanna tell us that they, they, the, uh, public, the Republican Party is the will of God. It's sort of, uh, even if it's not the will of God, it's at least the will of Father Abraham. Anyway, that's, that's what they call Lincoln as. So that, that's my, my take on this. And, uh, and of course, it's the ideological underpinning of the American state. That's why there's so much money put into it. That's why if you want a career as a historian in this area, you have to, you have to uh, toe the line. Uh, just, just like that, it's, uh, follow the money. I think, yes, sir, I think Adrian. I saw your, it seemed like you were getting slowed on the history channel when you had a glorified uh, Lincoln rant. I mean, it kind of just said, yeah, he was politically motivated. And I was wondering, there had to be something else there originally. <coughs> Oh yeah. Yeah, I did. I did that. Uh, the, the History Channel interviewed me for an hour and a half on tape. I went down to a studio in D.C. on a good ninety minutes, and and they had the woman who interviewed me had really good questions. She's a really smart person and had done her homework, and but they put you know no more than about ten seconds in three different segments of me on the show. It was like it was almost one of those subliminal. Messages, you know, flash, flash, flash Coca-Cola on the screen like like that, and, and they, and and they actually managed to make me sound like I was saying exactly the opposite of what I actually did say. They they managed to do that with all, with their editing, and so I knew there would be some kind of hatchet job, but I thought there was some probability that they would at least mention the title of my book, and it would sell books. So I thought it was, so my benefit cost calculation was. It'll probably sell enough books to be worth two hours of my time to go down and do this. So, uh, so I did it. But I knew there would be a hatchet job. But that, but that's what they did. You, you wouldn't have had any. You wouldn't have any possibility of knowing what I said in that interview by watching that segment on on the History Channel. And, they, and uh, I learned later that James McPherson was the advisor on that show. So I'm sure he had something to do with. Uh, but Eric Foner, they had about two hours of him. They just went on and on and on and on. It's just endless. Uh, the discussion by Foner on the same show. And that's, that's, time is up. <laughs>